Thank you, Mark. I'm very pleased to be back here because the subjects of World War II and the Navy have always been one that I've been fascinated by. And in the book, The Burning Shore, I've taken a slightly different tack from my earlier work, uh, Turning the Tide. In that earlier book, I focused on the, the, the ocean-wide campaign in the spring of 1943 where the Allies, after years of struggle, finally won the Battle of the Atlantic through, through just pure grit uh, and the barest uh, edge in technology. And this was a massive struggle, and therefore the, the history of it tends to span thousands of miles. In the Burning Shore, I was able to take a slightly different look, um, because in every big war, you still have encounters that are very, very on a small human level, and that's what I focus on in this particular book. I have uh, been able to get the accounts of a very daring 29-year-old U-boat commander named Horst Degen, who uh, conducted his third war patrol off the U.S. East Coast in the spring of 1942, and his adversary, a 23-year-old Army Second Lieutenant named Harry Kane, who was the pilot of a patrol bomber which encountered uh, Horst Degen's U-boat off Cape Hatteras on July 7th of that year. But before I talk about some of the details of the book, I'd like to review what I consider to be the most amazing revelation from the Battle of the Atlantic and for me from all of World War II that emerged in recent years and somehow has been overlooked. Uh, and it's, just, it's, it's confirmation proof of a naval disaster unprecedented in this country's history. So what I'd like to do is go back to Pearl Harbor. Um, this was, this was supposed to work. Um, in December of 1941, the Japanese stunned the Oh well. They say no war plan survives first contact with the enemy, and apparently it applies to uh, computer slide projectors. Um, your technical assistance would be marvelously welcome. Sure. Just one Don't advance it to the first slide. Okay. Oops. Was that the one you wanted? Back back? That one? Uh, one more. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll start with this one. Okay. Um, as you well know, on December 7, 1941, a task force of Japanese aircraft carriers uh, surprised and destroyed most of the U.S. Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor. It was a classic bolt from the blue assault that stunned military and political leaders from Pearl Harbor to Washington. Over the past 72 years, Naval historians, researchers, and journalists have searched diligently to find what they call the smoking gun of the conspiracy for Pearl Harbor, which was that essentially Roosevelt and his military commanders somehow knew the Japanese were heading to attack Pearl Harbor and yet chose to do nothing, to, to keep the local military in the dark so that the blow would fall and then the nation would be uh, a, a, would arise in wrath to, to defeat the Empire of Japan. And this is what the smoking gun document would look like. This is essentially a communications that was sent from the Commander Chief of the U.S. Fleet, um, Admiral Harold Stark, to all Pacific units in Hawaii, including uh, Admiral Husband Kimmel, at Pacific Fleet and his subordinates, the Pacific Air Forces, submarine forces, uh, the sea frontiers. And in this document, we have the following text. It's two days before Pearl Harbor. It says, 5 December, Imperial Japanese Navy estimate. Information received indicates, this is a code for the fact that intelligence has produce this information, that a large concentration of surface forces is at this location in the nor Northwest Pacific, bearing course th 135, 300 miles south-southeast of Adak, Alaska, with a projected course track 
placing them within 250 miles of Pearl Harbor by 0600 on 7, 7 December. And the evaluation was that the J Japanese Naval Task Force was en en route to attack the Pacific Fleet in Hawaii. Now, anyone who has read about Pearl Harbor remembers the controversy of, of the bolt from the blue. Uh, Admiral Husband Kimmel and General Walter Short were summarily relieved of command. Um, uh, the Navy and Army in Washington rushed out new uh, leaders, uh, Admiral, Admiral Nimitz uh, in particular, and they started to essentially drag the fleet back up from the mud and carry the fight to the enemy. But you can imagine what it would have been like had this document come to light, that 48 hours before the attack on Pearl Harbor, there was explicit detailed intelligence on the enemy's intention and movement predicting within a day or two that the attack was going to happen. Well, I'm glad to say that I made this up. <laughs> um, this is a complete fabrication, but what I based it on was something that is quite real. And if I can get this thing to work. I guess... Uh, da -da -da. I need to go to the next slide. Oh, yeah. Not that one. Where's the directory? I need to go to Cummage B. And this is the last one I'm going to show. Okay, this is the message that I based my, my Pearl Harbor message on. Uh, this message did exist and was found in the National Archives 15 years ago. And it, like the Pearl Harbor uh, forgery that I so clumsily made, this was from Admiral Stark to the Atlantic Fleet commander and all the Atlantic Fleet subordinates. And it was dated January the 12th, 1942, and it was a submarine estimate, information received, large concentration of U-boats proceeding to already arrived on station off Newfoundland and northeastern United States. And here it actually itemizes the U-boats and their clusters and their latitudes and longitudes. This was 36 hours before Admiral Carl Doinitz unleashed Operation Drumbeat against the Allies, which led to a, a slaughter of Allied shipping uh, along the U.S. East Coast for the next few months. Um, this message was in advance based on solid intelligence, particularly the British code breaking at Blessley Park, which was able to pinpoint their locations and also their, their intended movements. Now, why is this message so deadly? Well, it's because historians pretty, mal, pretty well agree that Pearl Harbor was a disaster, but the loss of Allied shipping along the U.S. East Coast in the first six months of 1942 was an order of magnitude greater in terms of its negative impact on the Allied war effort. During that time, the German U-boats, never more than six to eight at a time operating off the uh, coast, were able to sink over 500 merchant ships, killing thousands of, of, of invaluable civilian crewmen and depriving the Allied war effort of hundreds of thousands of tons of vital war cargo. And the thing that I found particularly fascinating as I continued my research into Operation Drumbeat was that the, the Atlantic Fleet, on the date this message came out, had more than 90 combat destroyers and Treasury-class Coast Guard cutters operating in the Atlantic. Most of them were pretty hardened and experienced from the two years of neut neutrality patrols that had taken place in 1940 and 1941 under the order of President Roosevelt. A particularly damning detail was that on the date this message uh, arrived in the entrace of every command along the Atlantic coast, there were 15 frontline Atlantic Fleet destroyers tied up in Staten Island, New York, awaiting final orders to take an Allied troop convoy from New York to Northern Ireland. This was a, um, a decision that had been made by Roosevelt